Philadelphia, and for those of you who are from Philly, welcome to this wonderful symposium. So um, I'm, I'm like a multitasker right now. So first, I want to introduce um, somebody really special to Mural Arts, then I'm going to come back and give a few words of welcome. So um, if you know Mural Arts, you know that we're a public-private organization. And um, we uh, have made it through five mayors, and we've worked with many, many people in city council. And I think that we're actually really lucky because we've gotten to work with some extraordinary civic leaders. And one of them is here today, and that is council member uh, Helen Gim. So let me just tell you about Helen for a minute. Uh, she leads a human rights agenda that, um, that measures outcomes-based um, on health and well-being. She's a longtime champion for a Green New Deal for public schools. She's leading a comprehensive environmental justice legislation through city council to address historic environmental racism within Philadelphia. She established the city's right to counsel program to provide legal assistance to low income tenants facing eviction and the city's nationally acclaimed eviction diversion program, which is incredible. She has also focused her legislative efforts on economic justice issues, including enacting the nation's strongest fair scheduling legislation and championing expanding the city's living wage laws, and she has been tenacious and tireless about that. Um, I just want to say that, um, you know, we can have all the good ideas in the world, but if people at the top of the food chain in Philly don't believe in what we're doing, we don't get very far. But because we have a champion and an advocate and a person like Helen in office, it means that we can move the needle. And not just we, meaning mural arts, but all of us, all of us who want a better world, we are lucky that Helen is in office and we're thrilled that she is joining us today. Helen Gim. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Jane, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you especially to Denise um, for the powerful opening to this symposium, especially in being able to hearken back the ancestors, to remind us of traditions, um, to remind us of language, and uh, the, the realization that actually for centuries um, people lived on on a planet without causing harm or destruction to it, living in harmony, understanding sustainability, passing it down to another generation as beautiful, as rich, as vibrant, and as green as it was in the generation in which they lived. And that we are actually living in a time of an anomaly, that we are the blip in history. Um, we are the ones who had been mentally, if not physically colonized in our thinking. And, um, and, and my hope is, is that that reminder is what the power of this symposium is. It is the power of art. It is not to tell uh, what we see in the world, but actually what we don't see. Um, so we are gathered here at this Environmental Justice Symposium with Mural Arts, our wonderful organization, homegrown, um, from the ground up, uh, delivered to us by a visionary in Jane Golden and in the multitude of people whom she has brought up into civic life and, um, and into this world to have an incredible conversation about environmental justice. We're gathered here to be truth tellers um, in a world as it exists today. And we are here most especially to be dreamers and visionaries to will into being a world that does not yet exist. Although it did once, I think, as Denise reminded us. It matters in matters of both our planet and in matters of justice. Both are not, could not be more urgent than they are right now. So a year ago, if you would have looked out, you know, from this very viewpoint, um, you would have looked onto a Vine Street Expressway that had flooded into a full-on canal in the aftermath of Hurricane Ida. The last time I think we had a conversation, or I joined a conversation with Mural Arts to discuss environmental justice, we were at Cherry Street Pier in October of last year, and we literally waded through floods that, that had gone through, you know, that were flooding through the roads in real time. I think the pier itself was, we were like, we have five minutes, we have 10 minutes, we have five minutes, we have three minutes, let's go. Um, and two weeks ago, you know, here in the city of Philadelphia, a new school year had just gotten underway when uh, on, the very, on the second day of school, half the district, more than 100 schools and tens of thousands of children had to um, close early because of the extreme heat 
and because we have not equipped our schools with the basic cooling systems to manage it. Um, these examples are recent and they are not in any way new. A fossil fuel driven economy and infrastructure built up all around us, whether you're in Philadelphia or anywhere else in this nation, has baked in inequity and injustice that is literally the difference between life and death. Consider the fact that there is a disproportionately high rate of, as of childhood asthma among black children in Philly's blackest neighborhoods. There is a 20 degree difference between zip codes um, that are just half a mile apart and a 20 year life expectancy difference between neighborhoods that are nearly adjacent to one another. This is the toxic outcome of racism, redlining, segregation, the defunding of our schools, and the idea that we can be so indifferent to the air we breathe and to the water we drink. This is violence that begets violence. And here at home then, our task is to prove that the environmental justice movement is a movement for justice around the material conditions in which our people suffer, and thus a movement for action to impact, improve, and transform the way our people live. It means that neighborhoods here in Philadelphia in the poorest areas, Eastwick, don't go underwater whenever the Schuylkill floods. It means that our Southwest neighbors adjacent to the former Sunoco oil refinery have a chance to lead and actually shape a clean air mandate for themselves, for their children, and for the city. It means that children and teachers don't suffer in 90 degree classrooms and that our elderly don't freeze in zero degree apartments. It means that we can dream it means that we can actually dream here of an FDR park where the natural landscape is prized and preserved, of communities with green spaces, rich tree canopies, and school playgrounds. And most important of all, I want this conversation to be about here. Um, I was so excited when I heard that there were people coming here from all over, um, in cities big and small, um, because I am a huge believer in municipal politics. I come out of 20 years of organizing in Philadelphia's communities. I ran for the very first time in 2016, not because I was seeking a position on council, but because I thought that politics at the local level was closest to movements on the ground. And here at home, we have the chance to make the difference, that we don't have to actually wait for st state legislatures or a Congress that has completely abandoned a, a climate mandate, a racial justice mandate, an economic justice mandate. But here in our own municipalities, we transform the way we think, and we can thus transform the way the country thinks. There is nobody, nobody in your state, nobody in, in DC or anywhere else that will fight harder for your people than the people on the ground in their own communities. And that's why I believe in local politics. That's why I believe that the solutions start here. In rooms like this, I want us to remind ourselves that rooms like this are the most powerful, that they are the starting point for any kind of political possibility. There is no politics that isn't fundamentally driven by the people who are going to drive it themselves. And if we are disturbed, um, upset, angry, furious about, then that is a politics that has been controlled by other entities and not by us. So if we want to change that, then this is the investment that we need to make in each other. This is the investment that we need to hear across ideas. This is the energy that will bring us back when everything just seems to drain us out. So this is why I'm most hopeful. I'm gonna just very quickly say, um, you know, there are two things that we are working on here in Philadelphia from both a people, community-based angle, and also from, um, from a policy angle at the local level. Um, we want a Green New Deal for our schools. I want to talk about what it means when we talk about generations and how to transform um, the lives of people now for their families, um, that schools are not just merely places where young people go in and disappear and they come out and, you know, their parents, you know, or whatever. This is a, a blueprint for the city. The blueprint for the city is the fact that every single school was supposed to be in walking distance of every child in the city. No more than a mile and a quarter were they supposed to walk. And thus, it is a roadmap accessing every single family, accessing every single neighborhood and community. It can be a promise that actually in neighborhoods long left behind, we can start with our young people, with new generations, with their families who bring them in, and with the surrounding communities in which they live to give them clean water, 
in their schools to ensure that they are not only not poisoned by lead, uh, asbestos, and mold, that they don't have roofs that don't leak and windows that can't open, but actually that we can do more than that. We can do so much more than that, that the possibility of green playgrounds brings joy, vitality, and life, and a reminder that childhood is about those exact things, that they are about joy and possibility. This is not about remediation and testing and all of this stuff, but that fundamentally, the external vision of a school is of play, of possibility, of friendship, and of community um, beyond your families. Um, I said very clearly that I also think that this is one of the places where movements like ours merge with labor rights movements, that we actually are thinking about jobs for the future, that we have to talk about economy, that we can't talk about abstract things um, about climate and justice that feel so far away from people, but that actually people need to see people within their own communities working in the, in the institutions that people go to and rely upon every day, and whether that is a school, whether that is a park, whether that, whether that is a library like this, whether it is new housing that could be built that, a, that is affordable to communities, that we do have to merge a climate justice movement with an economic justice movement, with a labor rights movement, with a racial justice movement, that these things are not fundamentally separate from one another, otherwise just don't attach justice to anything. Like, it's just gotta be that way. Um, so we are working on what that can look like and how it can be transformative. Um, and the second thing I'll say is that, you know, um, in 2019, Philadelphia was on the national news because an oil refinery, refinery literally blew up on national TV. This is an oil refinery that was the oldest and largest on the East Coast. Unsurprisingly, it had been taken over by private equity that drove the labor uh, well-being of, of long-time individuals into the ground and then turned it into a place where something like that could actually happen. And we thank um, everything in between every single day that people were not seriously harmed, that the toxic fumes that entered into the air were not actually reaching individuals right then and there. Um, but we are very clear that that was a visual of the ways in which um, primarily black and brown communities in the Southwest neighborhoods have been living for decades. And that in one of the most concentrated uh, residential areas of the city, that we had a major wake up call to see a transformation of, of literally the air we breathe, only led by the people who had been so long denied all of that. So we um, introduced, along with members of Philly Thrive, um, a groundbreaking Community Health Act. It requires, many of you may have known, that the Supreme Court removed the possibility for the EPA to actually evaluate companies on um, environmental and air pollution, which is shocking or not from this particular Supreme Court. But when that happens, that means that municipalities have to act. It doesn't mean that we're like, oh, there's nothing we can do. In fact, this is where we assert our municipal and local authority to say we, that we will introduce a law to activate our health department in the interest of the public health of our people to now evaluate new development based on air emissions and, and in particular to measure air pollution and toxicity to determine its relativity in comparison to other areas of the city, to map out and identify particular neighborhoods and areas that are subjected to greater air pollution that leads to greater childhood asthma or illnesses or lung disease or other types of things, and that this is actually a municipal mandate. So we introduced and are moving through our city council body, the Community Health Act, and we hope that it gives encouragement and attention to what's possible. Um, and I'll end here. I, I, I believe that every generation, and ours no less than others, and probably more than, than, than most, have faced challenges that are as moral as they are political. And this challenge of whether we will fund our schools equitably or not, whether we will give each and every child a fair start um, that can be defined by how we look at their lived environment, the question of whether we go into communities that have been so long left behind um, and actually deliver something that brings an economic difference, a visible difference, a housing difference, an educational difference to those communities. That 
more than anything else in the world should define us in this moment, that that is what defines us as a body politic, that you don't look at Philadelphia and see just a skyline, that when you are here in this city and in this room, that you feel more than ever the urgency of people trying to overcome an urgency of people to fight for their children, um, for themselves, and for future generations. And that is how we are ultimately going to define ourselves in this city. So I want to thank everybody um, for all of your commitment here. And I just look forward to what you will come, come forward with now. All right, that's what I'm talking about. One more round of applause. That was amazing and inspiring. Um, and also, Denise, I wanted to say thank you, too. That was, that was so inspiring and will stay with me. Your words will stay with me for a long time and um, all of us. Um, so, uh, you know, I just want to uh, start by saying I'm really humbled by this gathering and by the work the Mural Arts Institute is doing. I also, I, so I want to acknowledge, she thanked everybody in the world, but Netanyahu Portier. Can we have a round of applause for Netanyahu? Um, I also want to acknowledge my colleague, Shari Hirsch, who runs our environmental justice program. Really important work is coming out of that. And, every, and people who are here for mural arts. I mean, I'm up here talking, but it's a village of people who are all extraordinary and committed. And, um, you know, I want to say that we... Um, that we believe, I have these remarks, but I think I'm going to deviate, um, that, you know, um, I, it's so interesting to come after Helen, because I love the way her mind works. It's both aspirational and it's very pragmatic. And I like to think that mural arts is sort of the same way. And um, when you think about the critical issues that the world is grappling with, it's often sort of a knee-jerk response to think that art is somewhere over there or it's just not in that ecosystem. And yet what we've seen time and time and time again for 30 years is the role that art plays like a profound role in many issues. If it's our, you know, criminal justice work or behavioral health or environmental justice or in community development or a, a art education, like we see this thread that runs throughout. And because we're part of city government but we are not city government, We've been able to carve out a kind of autonomy and distance, but yet create, have lots of allies within government who can help us move the needle. And I think I want to say that I admire so much what you all are working on, um, because I see how you're looking at these issues in the most creative way possible. I mean, our traditional interventions fail us. They just do, right? And they do again and again. And somehow in our society, it's sort of like, OK. And it's like people just get a pass. And yet, when you bring artists and art making to the table, something cracks open. Like I think about the plastic bag campaign. Like there are all kinds of ways you could have approached that. But the way the Environmental Justice Division did it was so interesting. And then these implosions that Shari has. And just, well, it's like, how do we look at things in a different way. The restorative justice program, like we have a 6 to 8% recidivism rate. People are like, oh, that's so low. Right, because there's so many creative beings in the world who just don't have opportunities. Or in the Porchlight program, where we're working with people facing housing insecurity or struggling with addiction. And suddenly, people are being treated with dignity and respect and their opportunities. And the work becomes like a lifeline. But there's something else going on, and that is about mutuality so that we're learning all the time as well, all the time. We're learning from all of you, and we want to dignify. We want to really dignify that, that part of the Institute. Because the Institute, as Netanyahu said, is about knowledge sharing. Yeah, I think maybe in the beginning we thought, oh, yeah, this is about you know, replicating a model. But it's really not, because it's about working with you and your communities and you sort of sharing your knowledge with us. And it's about the field. And the field is so important because it can easily get lost as we keep doing the same things over and over and over again. And I'm just a huge believer in what art can do because I've seen the light shine through. I'm a witness to the transcendent power of art. 
for 30 years. Friday night, we had an event. We're doing a project about the 13th Amendment. And standing on Independence Mall and listening to family members who have loved ones who have been locked away and were probably, they're there with life without parole, but they created these extraordinary works of art about the 13th Amendment. And you could see people learning from this. And it was like, oh, somehow it took art to sort of crack it open. And when you look at activists and organizers and artists, people who are doing policy work, people like Helen coming together, you start to feel a sense of hope that maybe, maybe things in this world that are so set and so intractable, where we've come to value borders, divisions, and boundaries more than anything else, that maybe things can change. So I have huge gratitude to all of you for your tenacity, for your vision, for your courage, because I understand the kind of fearlessness that this work takes, a relentlessness to keep driving forward in spite of obstacles. And when someone tells me no, my colleagues know this, I just go around them. <laughs> and I want to impart that in all of you. <laughs> Never stop. But um, I want to say that I'm proud, to, I'm proud of our partners, and I want to name some people because I think it's important. I want to acknowledge the team of Raisin in the Sun and the Mosaic Workshop who are here from Austin. where they are building partnerships and transforming spaces in the heart of East Austin. From Kern County, California, we welcome here the talented artist Michelle Glass and collaborating environmental justice activist Dr. Rosanna Esparza and the executive directors of the Central California Environmental Justice Network and the Central Valley Air Quality Coalition. Welcome. Leaders from Alas de Agua and Three Sisters are taking a break from their collaborative work at First Full Circle Farm in Santa Fe, New Mexico to be here with us this week. Welcome. <laughs> Yay. Woo. Together, they are expanding access to agriculture and artistic traditions, exchanges, and continu continu con continuity across generations and communities. Really wonderful work. Um, and I can't wait to see what's going on, and I can't wait for them to share their work and many documentaries with all of us today. Um, each city has its own set of challenges regarding art and environmental justice, and therefore its own set of responses. Um, we have learned so much from them, and that is really the basis of the Mural Arts Institute. Um, so I want to say that, um, you know, when facing challenging conditions, something that we all face all the time, Optimism is sometimes a reach too far. No one knows the future, so assertions of happy endings or total disaster are sort of impossible to predict. But yet, when we see the vast human potential in our midst, and I say that as I look out in this audience, um, whether or not we make ourselves believe that things will be actualized or not, we have the healing consolation of knowing, of knowing that it is always 100% worth trying and that the trying itself is sometimes the best balm for our fears. For all of you, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. The work you do makes a huge statement on behalf of possibility. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jane, for your remarks. My name is Alyssa Collier, and I am the Senior Program Manager for the Mural Arts Institute. It's my pleasure to invite our first panelist up to be seated. We have with us members of the Climate Justice Initiative panel and members of the Strategy Circle. So I will let you take it away. Thanks.
I'll start. I, I think he'll be back. Um, we're going to talk about practicing a more just future. I'm Shari Hirsch, um, the director of the Environmental Justice Department. And we are all part of the Climate Justice Initiative. And Jonathan is the convener of the Strategy Circle. And he's going to start, and then um, we're going to speak. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Thanks for being here. Thanks to Jane. Thanks to Denise. Thanks to Council Member Gim and everybody else. Um, I don't have a whole lot to say by way of introduction, um, except that, yes, this is uh, the Climate Justice Initiative of the Environmental Justice Department at Mural Arts. Um, my name is Jonathan. I am the Strategy Circle Convener. I will be speaking a little bit later about the structure of the project uh, and how we got to where we are today, um, but really excited to hear what the rest of the panel has to say. Um, we're going to be going through the background, uh, which Shari and Dakota are going to be talking about, uh, sort of the laying the groundwork for the project, all the interviews uh, that gave rise to the principles and commitments and values. Um, I'll be talking about the structure, knowledge sharing, circles. Uh, Dakota and Denise are going to be speaking about building relationships with indigenous artists and activists. Uh, Adriana and uh, Lauren and Anthony from the Iglesias Garden are going to be talking about balancing the needs of diverse collaborators. And then we'll have time for questions and a little break at the end. Uh, we're not going to be too tight on this, but Sepide asked us to speak about um, the intentionality of a project, like how to do a project intentional from the very beginning. Because she said sometimes that happens, people think they're going to be intentional, it sort of falls apart. So we're going to tell you just about our journey. So to do a project about climate justice, we felt it would be um, disingenuous not to have a just structure. And so um, we wanted to model a more just future, the future we want to be a part of. And we wanted to work in a way that reverses hierarchical, nonprofit, and capitalist structures. And we wanted to practice um, being a more just project and doing that inside of a nonprofit that is indeed hierarchical. So we're going to tell you what that's like. Do you have anything to say about that? No. Okay. So we started um, all of the projects in the Environmental Justice Department come out of participants. They could be participants on other projects, et cetera, neighbors, whatever. So we, when we initiate a project, it's coming from people we're involved with, from communities. And the Climate Justice Initiative came out of the Trash, um, trash Academy. So um, we, we had these this idea about um, being people-centered, valuing people, um, about caring. You saw that a, that a non, the opposite of an extractive kind of approach where it's about profit. And we wanted to build um, caring amongst ourselves. And we wanted the benefits of the project, all the labor on the project, everyone to benefit from the project. So there's a lot in art where there's a famous artist, a renowned artist, and all the other labor is invisible. So we really believe in reciprocity, and we wanted to practice reciprocity. Um, and I think behind that, so then the, the financial capital, the um, social capital is shared by everyone on the project. So our original group of people came from um, people we know, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, not from experts. And behind that, a whole bunch of you know about Reconstruction Inc., because that's where we started three years ago, these three cohorts, you know, with uh, William Goldsby. And we hold those values really strong of moving from alienation to building community, from um, codependency to reciprocity, and from individualism to collectivism. So while we... <laughs> did this huge project and we're still in the middle of it, we moved to practice those values that are really in contradiction to the world that we live in. Yeah, and in, um, 
in practicing those values, we had to build a project that was, I mean, we're talking a lot about intentionality, so it had to be more organic and flexible. Uh, we encouraged all the collaborators to pick the parts that were valuable to them and their organizations, and um, only if they can pick and choose what sections they stay on for, and we had to uh, have more collective decision making and a more flexibility in our timelines and all those things are how we injected the uh, people first uh, human capital value in this project. So one thing we did when we started is we interviewed, it says there's 26 people here, I think we actually interviewed 27, so someone's really missing. And we asked people about their point of entry um, we asked, um, you know, what it was that made them stay. And it was really interesting what we found out because we found out that people who had a frontline experience and experience, and weather, you can see I combined them up there because some people had experience with Katrina and they went down not as people who were um, in the hurricane, but people who did the, correct, the contributions afterwards. There were people who experienced an, uh, an event with trash um, and dumping. So we found out that um, firsthand experience is a huge point of entry. And we also found out that working with others is another huge point of entry, why people stay. And I don't know if you guys know this, but traditional environmental organizations do not have the staying power of people involved in environmental justice campaigns and, and movement building. Um, yeah, the really, I mean, the beautiful thing about the interviews was that everyone being interviewed was from a very diverse background. They had different stories, but the similarities came with why they were doing the work and why they were sticking with the work. And we kind of structured the project around those things, um, which created, helped create a network, which we'll talk about. Did I skip one? No. Okay. So the, by the way, the five original people who did this research, did we have a name for what we called it back then? <laughs> uh, affectionately, we were a clique. <laughs> <laughs> we called ourselves a clique. We, um, they were activists, organizers, and um, people who were involved in environmental justice. We did not invite in academics. We did not invite in consultants and experts. We did it ourselves. This was an intentional thing because to make a change around climate, it is not going to be at the expert level only. They, maybe they're involved, but it's about everyone making a change. And it's very, like what Helen Gim said, it's local, it's like regional, it's us. It's what we can do and how to strengthen those networks and invest in those networks. So one informative thing was this landscape assessment, and that is by the Tishman Environment and Design Center. It's a beautiful, beautiful piece of research, and they had just finished it when we were formulating this project, and we, um, we were taught about it before it was even published. And we looked at when they had in, in, um, interviewed all these different EJ groups from across the country, what, what was effective, what their goals were. They compared it to environmental groups, and we, from that, we could see that what can art do? Because art can't do certain things. You have to be um, uh, intentional what art can do. And we said we can work with shifting a narrative because we make pictures and messaging. And we said that we could um, work with creative disruptions, which they said are very hard to get funded. And creative disruptions are actions that change your perception, change the status quo. And you can think back in history to like act up doing die-ins. That's a performative piece of art. That was like, oh my God, all these people dying from AIDS. So a creative disruption is something that changes your way of thinking. You know, the, the original plastic bag bans in California, the people who dressed with 350 bags, that's the average person's use of a bag in a year. I think it's way more than that, but uh, actually visualizing it changed people's perception of the impact of bags. Do you have anything on this one? No, I'll okay. start the next one. Um, yeah, so being more people-centered and uh, adjusting the structure of this project led to a lot of uh, positive outcomes beyond the planned events of the murals, the teach-ins, things like that. The 
the networking like naturally formed these spontaneous collaborations with a lot of the members of um, the participants that were, um, you know, a surprise impromptu. And uh, one of the examples was the uh, trash and dumping campaign. Yes, yeah, so um, there was a trash circle on the climate justice initiative, and one of the people presented on C and D waste. C and D waste is this enormous climate impact, and um, there's very few people working on C and D waste. And so we got invited to a uh, do a residency at a C and D waste facility. We actually applied two years before that, so the we got in because of COVID. So we went out there, the trash circle from this project, we did a deep dive into C and D waste and we actually found out that one of the main things on the yard is actually what's in our neighborhoods in Philadelphia, it's drywall. It's one of the biggest dumped items. So we formed a group that, you know, the, the trash circle did a deep dive and we found out that dumping is actually solvable. It's like this problem we all accept in Philly and it turns out not so. So the campaign to have um, all our mayoral candidates have a plan, a functional plan around managing waste, and in particular around dumping, is kicking off September 22nd. Priscilla Bell, who's from the, also on our project on CJI, is going to lead Trash Academy, and we have a campaign organizer, and um, we have about, I don't know, about 50 people signed up to be part of this, and we're going to develop a platform and insist that the mayoral candidates take it on. You can see that um, map in the center, which thanks to Nick um, over there, that we have a litter index in Philadelphia, and that those red areas are where they had to use heavy equipment. And you can see it overlined with the overlaid with the red lining map. So that's the kind of um, historical injustice and multiple burdens on communities in Philly. So that's like a concrete thing that comes out of this project from the networks that we're building together and investing in. So we really believe in, um, in relationships and what can come from them. Jonathan's gonna talk about the structure. Okay. Um, and originally I had a, a partner in crime to help present this with me, Gamar Markarian, who was the design strategist for couple of years in this project who unfortunately was not able to make it today, but shout out to Gamar if you're listening on the live stream. Um, so yeah, Shari and Dakota talked a bit about the, the structure of the initiative and how we wanted it to model the kind of just future that we want to create and be a part of. So what does that actually look like? Part of that is distributed leadership, and um, we use the model that's known as the action circle model uh, in a lot of grassroots organizing. Um, I'm just curious by show of hands, like who's, who's heard of action circles or been a part of an action circle? Maybe, oh, just a, just a couple people. All right, cool. Um, in, in a lot of, well, I'm gonna talk about it on the next slide. Um, <laughs> another part of the structure, as you've heard a lot about uh, already, is knowledge sharing. So what was that? Uh, why did we do it? And how did we accomplish it in this project? Um, and then finally, there were some changes to the structure and some challenges to the structure that we encountered um, over the course of the past two years of working on this project. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that as well. Okay. Um, I love this slide, um, and thank you, Shari, for including it in the slideshow. I remember uh, when I first joined the project in uh, around this time in 2020, uh, in the fall, um, and Shari showed me this picture, and I'm, I'm not a visual artist. I'm, I'm a musician and, and an organizer and an educator, but I'm not a visual artist at all. So I looked at this picture, I was like, Shari, what the heck is this supposed to be? Um, but over the course of many conversations, I came to understand and appreciate uh, what this represents. So you can see here um, the many different circles uh, that make up the Climate Justice Initiative. There's a land circle uh, of artists, activists, and organizers who are doing work around land justice in Philadelphia and, and throughout Lenape Hoking. Um, there's an air circle of folks who are working on air quality and air pollution issues. There's a trash circle uh, of people who are doing things related to the dumping and, and, and waste management. And then there are also these other circles that I don't know if you can see from where you're sitting, but strategy circle, which is most of the folks up on the panel here, um, the communication circle um, and an art circle. And I think there was supposed to be an advisor circle, but I don't think we actually have one. So that's another one of those changes to the structure. Um, one thing that this slide doesn't show is that there's a lot of overlap between these circles. So one thing that, that I think makes the action circle model of organizing unique is that there's a lot of overlap 
um, between who's on the different circles. Uh, and there's, they're not in these sort of like separate compartmentalized um, circles as you see in the image here. So imagine a little bit of overlap there. Um, the strategy circle in terms of size is, is smaller than most of the other circles. Um, but you know, even though we're doing distributed leadership and we want there to be leaders throughout every circle and we want every circle to have some degree of autonomy, um, it is an unavoidable fact of reality that the strategy circle is making some you know, sort of bigger picture decisions about the arc of the project, the timeline of the project, um, with the advice and the consent of the other circles uh, as well. Um, together, all of these circles do knowledge sharing, uh, which is then used to create a mural um, with the help of the great Yuri Jones and the rest of the art circle as well. Um, there are, which feeds into creative disruptions, which Shari just spoke about and which are, um, which I won't say anything about now because uh, I just won't. Um, and there's a, there's a hub space as well at the Iglesias Gardens, um, which you'll see uh, more in the slides a little bit later. Um, I think that's all I want to say about this particular slide. And I think next I moved the mural here. Yeah, I did. Um, here's the mural. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's nice, right? It's nice. Um, I, wish I, could, I wish I could zoom on here. And if you go to climatejusticeinitiative.com to our website, you can see um, not only a, a larger scale, um, well, I guess this is pretty big here, uh, uh, high resolution image of this, but also actually a 10 minute animated video narrated in part by Denise and other collaborators on the project um, that describes in detail what all of these images represent, because it's a lot, there's a lot of stuff packed in here, right? There's over two dozen collaborators on the project who all were part of the knowledge sharing process. So it, it's, it's a lot of imagery to take in, right? Um, I, I highly recommend checking out that video. Um, it's beautiful narration, beautiful description um, of all the different imagery. Um, I'm curious, just to get a little bit of audience participation going in here, um, is there anything about the, the mural image as, as you're looking at it that like really jumps out at you, that you either like or that you have a question about? Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That relationship building that Shari was talking about. I like the fact that the tree is clearly cut down, but the branches that come out is kind of like nature will survive. <laughs> totally, totally. I feel like like going back to what Denise was saying, like, yes, sure, there's been a lot of destruction, there's been a lot of struggle and, and yet we you know, still we rise, yeah. The moon and the sun, beautiful, absolutely. And the moon, I don't know if you can see from where you're sitting, but the moon has, I think, 13 different symbols around the edges that represent the different full moons in the complete lunar cycle, um, which you can hear more about in the video. Yeah, maybe one more, yeah. Turtles are badass. <laughs> turtles are badass, absolutely. And this turtle is, is uh, you know, fighting off a black snake, um, which, little little controversial image there that got us uh, canceled from a few walls that we tried to get on in Philly. <laughs> but we finally found a wall, and we're very, very happy um, to announce that we, we do uh, have a wall plan for this mural. It's going to be on the front of the next fab building, which is just down the block from the Iglesias Garden um, in North Philly. So you can literally just walk like five blocks from the garden to where the mural will ultimately be. Um, I think in the spring is when we're planning to start actually installing it. So we're very, very excited about that, and we'll definitely keep you all posted about dedications and events. We do plan to have educational and workshop events at the site of the mural once it's complete. Um, yes. So all this knowledge sharing that you've heard a little bit about, um, it happened virtually on Zoom because this was in 2020 and 2021. All the different circles um, got together and basically told their stories, right? Um, the past, the present, and the future of their community, of their environmental justice issue that they're facing. Many of the collaborators on our project had previous relationships with each other, but some of them did not. And this was a great opportunity to get folks working on air issues, folks working on land issues, folks working on trash issues, um, all together in the same virtual room, um, you know, talking about their common obstacles, uh, their common solutions, uh, and their analysis. Um, what are the root causes? Uh, and, and what are what are their communities working on to make things better? Um, why why do we do this? I mean, 
relationship building, obviously cross-pollination and just building common understanding, common language, so that we can then create the kinds of artwork um, that you just saw, um, so people are on the same page. Um, I know Shari has something to add about why we do knowledge sharing as well, so I'm going to tag you in. Yeah, for, can, can you guys hear me? I think you have to push the... Yeah, for um, public art, um, often it, you know, the traditionals just drop into a neighborhood. The next level up is drop in and say, please participate with us. But to decolonize the process, the imperative for the project has to come from community members itself. And we can't act like there is no history where we're going in. It's everyone sharing their history and their preoccupations to form the project together. So it's about um, reversing how we go in, how we work with people. So knowledge sharing is essential from an environmental justice perspective, that the people impacted share their knowledge and their history before there's any, any action taken. Awesome, thank you, Shari. Um, yes, and you can actually see the results of all of these teach-ins. Because they were done virtually, they were all recorded. Um, and you can see them on our website at climatejusticeinitiative.com, and they're also on our YouTube channel. Um, so I hope folks will check those out. Um, we've been uh, publicizing those to a lot of um, educators, high school teachers um, throughout the city uh, who might want to be using these in their classrooms um, as an opportunity to get, you know, regular, everyday, ordinary people who have, who have activist roots, who have organizing experience, uh, who are artists, who are working on issues in their community um, as, a, as an inspiration for the students. Um, changes and challenges, and here's that moon again. Um, so there were definitely changes and challenges to the structure um, and the process uh, throughout this project, as I think probably won't surprise anybody, um, especially folks who've been working on public art and organizing projects throughout uh, an ongoing pandemic. Um, I think change is obviously a natural and expected part um, of any project. Um, so one of the changes that we encountered was that this idea of distributed leadership, we wanted to have on every circle, on every action circle, um, to have a convener of each circle, basically a grassroots leader on that circle who would be not only a collaborator um, participating at the level at, as all other collaborators are participating in, um, but actually would step up to some additional responsibilities, some additional facilitation, um, some additional coordination with the strategy circle, um, extra time, and just like Shari and Dakota mentioned, of course that comes with additional compensation um, in their contract as well. So on every circle, uh, you know, we spoke with different people about like, hey, would you be interested, would you be available to take on a little bit of extra leadership role in this process? Um, and unfortunately, uh, you know, in spite of having those conversations with people over months and years, um, you know, there were people who stepped up to those roles, but just as a fact of life, like people who are frontline activists and organizers, and who also have family lives and jobs and, and medical issues and all these different sorts of things, um, it, it seemed like it was outside most people's capacity to actually step up and take those extra leadership roles in the way that we had originally envisioned. So even though part of the structure of the, the project originally was like, let's, let's have leaders and let's support leaders and let's recognize the leadership that exists in communities, ultimately we kind of had to say like, actually people don't really have the time for that. Um, and that's okay, you know, we adapt. Um, similarly, collaborators stepping up and stepping back over the course of the project. Um, I don't see this as a good thing or a bad thing. It's just, a, again, it's just a fact of life, kind of like the phases of the moon changing. Um, but one of the benefits of having such a broad and diverse network of collaborators is that people can step up and people can step back and it doesn't sink the project, right? Um, in, in certain seasons, in certain years, you know, as people's different life situations wax and wane, um, they can step up and they can step back and, and we'll still be here for them when they're uh, ready to take on new roles. Um, and then finally, uh, we've, we've had some transitions on the strategy circle as well. Um, I think that's, again, a, a fact of life, but also I think there is some, some reflection and some uh, analysis that we can do as a strategy circle about like, why is it specifically um, that, and I'll just say that, that two of the black members of the strategy circle chose to leave the strategy circle for different reasons. Um, and I think it does require some thinking and some conversation on our part about why that might be the case and how we can do a better job of attracting and recruiting and retaining um, folks that stay on the project. And I'll pass it over to Dakota and Denise. Yeah. 
Yeah, so, so like Jonathan was saying, uh, no matter how intentional you are with a project like this, uh, it's bound to get a little messy. You're bound to make mistakes. And for us, uh, part of that learning curve was how to include indigenous perspective in the project. Um, from the beginning, we knew with a project like this, we were going to have to include indigenous perspective. And in the initial interviews, we had uh, native representation. There were artists and activists already doing work in the, uh, in the Philadelphia area. But we failed to include specifically uh, local Lenape tribes in that discussion. And so from the beginning, we were missing that direct and specific connection to this land. Um, so then a few months into the project, we start communicating with the local Lenape communities. And we're trying to integrate them into the project. Um, but the circles had already formed. Collaborators are already making plans and networking, drafting ideas. And so that felt these, that made these communities naturally feel like they were something of an afterthought and they were being rushed into the project to meet timelines. And then we also had an issue of we were very reliant on uh, digital communication and that doesn't necessarily work for every community. Um, so we had to, so that left a lot of the new collaborators feeling frustrated and as though we weren't centering indigenous perspective in the project. Uh, and they were just being tacked on as a way to move the project along. Uh, and so after one particularly contentious meeting, uh, I personally had something of a wake up call. Um, my mother is Passamaquoddy, so I was the one member of the strategy circle that uh, had a familiarity with native culture, specifically East Coast native culture. Um, and I realized that the issue was that we were re reverting back to our comfort zone. Uh, we had those ingrained tendencies that come with working in a nonprofit setting and working with artists and activists. And we weren't, uh, we weren't realizing that these com communities were not artists and activists. They weren't people that put themselves out there to do this work. They were people that just happened to be born into the circumstance of environmental justice affecting them more than most. Um, and so the same reason that I was initially passive about communicating these concerns to the strategy circle more directly was the same reason that there was this conflict and that was that we were not address we were not accounting for the additional emotion emotional burden of environmental justice work for indigenous people. Uh, I mean, I don't need to explain to this audience what the toll of assimilation, cultural genocide, uh, economic disadvantages has on these communities. Um, when you consider all those things, Native people typically have a lot issues in their lives that outweigh broader activist work like a project like this. Um, so we needed to reset and reset to our intentions of being people-centered. We needed to stop asking, do you want to do this work? Do you want to share? Do you want to join this project? Because when you consider all those things, you can understand why someone might not want to do that. Uh, instead, we had to ask, are you willing to share? How can this project benefit you and your community? And once we started focusing on um, that recentering, we we had a lot more success collaborating. But before we get into any of that, I'll leave it to uh, Denise to explain the <laughs> artist's perspective. Hi, hi again, everyone. Um, so yeah, as Dakota was saying, it's it's a tough process, and and I do acknowledge that when you're outreaching to indigenous people. Um, my family, my personal family, I'll speak on, were very reluctant, and um, some would consider unopen. Um, you, but the trick is, if you get to know them, and they trust your intent, then you'll get more than you expected. So with that said, like Dakota was saying, getting to know people, asking them in the right way, showing them that you're coming in a good way will take you farther because there is that instinctual level of distrust. 
So with that said, when uh, I got a, a phone call from an elder in Cheswold, and she was like, you know, they're pushing around this idea. They need an artist. And I have been doing artwork since forever um, and getting involved in activism. And um, I took a, a class on E. Cornell, which is a great class, by the way, on climate justice leadership. Um, so with that said, they know these things about me and they were like, here, go handle that, you know, and that's how I got on board. Um, and honestly, it was a pleasant surprise because I met so many people with the same goals that were receptive and open to learning that I'm sure there are new doors now and new friendships and new alliances and new allyships that um, will push us all further in, in, our, in our same fight for, for climate justice. So I'm, I'm very pleased with that. And I can take that back to not only my community, I can take that back to communities in Delaware, um, my Ponca family in, in Oklahoma, um, and my, my children are actually inspired by that too, um, out in Arizona and the University of Minnesota. So, you guys have expanded more than you know, honestly, and I'm, I'm, I'm truly grateful for that. Um, so that said, my, my, it's, it's always been in a, a, a goal of mine and a passion of mine to, to give back to this, this earth that gives so much without question to us, right? Um, as um, Jonathan said, that moon, I, I, I drew those, those cycles on that moon. Um, showing that circular motion of life and that giving, that reciprocity, right? That was our calendar, right? It wasn't, uh, we ran out of money today, let's go get another one. It was, it's time to get to work. It's time, hey, the, the shad fish are in the river because those shad lilies are blooming. That's how you know that. That's how you live in unity with the land. So that's always been a passion of mine. It's always been a passion of mine to reach out, and um, you, you feel so small, right? And I know a lot of you, um, you activists can, can understand no matter what direction you're coming from, this problem is so big and you feel so tiny in it, right? Um, but collectively, we can do a lot together, and no is not the answer. I always tell my children when someone says no, go find a window, go find a back door, or just stand there until a no is yes, or at least a conversation, right? So again, that moving forward, since I started with uh, mural arts, I said, well, what else can I do to take it further? And as an artist with intimidation, I applied for Oklahoma School of Law um, in their indigenous peoples program. So I'm studying indigenous peoples law. I will graduate in May and I am learning that language. I appreciate that. I'm, I'm learning that language. Um, law school with a JD is not off the table. We'll see what happens. My son now is getting his JD. My daughter is getting her PhD. And collectively, a little Miss Honor over there, Honor the Earth is her name. And that's on her birth certificate. <laughs> um, so I kept her out of school today because I want to, I want to fertilize what we've, what we're doing here, and in the direction we're going, and those next generations. So you make sure you tell your children, you know, pick up that trash, and and I mean, she could probably tell you lots of stories about a lot of the flack she gets at school for pushing people out of their comfort zone and in a direction that we all need to go. But I celebrate her in that, and I'm appreciative that she listens. Um, so today, what I'm up to, <laughs> besides law school, and you'll see um, there's, a, there's a GoFundMe up there. And so the history behind that is I'm, I'm helping a local farmer named Donald Goldsboro. And I, I heard him on the local radio complaining about what's happening in his local farmlands, okay? So I live down in Delaware along that Apoquinimic River, which is Lenape for a place we stayed a long time, right? So they've, the uh, state of Delaware rezoned that area um, to prevent or to help clean up toxicity 
um, along that Delaware River and they turned it all into preservation lands, right? And so in learning that language that I was telling you about, um, in the push to go green, which is all what we want to do, right? But you have to think very importantly about with the end in mind. What we're, are we in, going so fast? Are we thinking about, all right, if we're putting in these solar panels, how are we, um, we going to recycle them? What happens when they break down? So what's happening to Mr. Goldsboro is that they want to call it uh, harvesting the sun, and they want to, and they're not supposed to build on these lands, but they want to put over 200 acres of solar panels and disrupt that preservation land. So he's fighting that, and he was like, you know, that just changes the language of what this land was used for. Um, and that, you know, if we change that language now, where, where are we going to be later? Because it's all about language, and if you open that door a crack, then the rest of the... Um, it's just open season to, to whatever else ideas people come. So, you know, as we're going green, think about what's going to happen. Think about those next seven generations and just be cautious how you're doing it and so that we don't have to repeat ourselves, right? We don't have to learn by example, say, hey, that didn't work. We really messed that up. Let's go over here now or let's do that and let's do this. And in Indian country out west, they're having a lot of trouble out there because guess what? While some of their lands are disrupted, some of their lands have not been. And so that's the prize now, to look at those lands like, oh, well, we haven't disturbed. Let's go dig there. Let's go look for something there. So that's not what we want to do. We want to clean up the mess we made, and we want to do it in the right way. Okay. And the last thing that I want to say is that I'm extremely supportive of MMIWUSA.org. And if you don't know about MMIW, it's Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women, Children, and Boys, and Men, okay? Indigenous women, indigenous people are 10 times more likely to go murdered and missing than any other ethnicity. And on my fo I follow them on Instagram, and um, you know I encourage you to go seek out these answers um, because I get an alert multiple times a day about someone going missing in this nation that's indigenous. But that doesn't make the news here. So we need to pay attention to what's going on to our indigenous people because it happens to them first, because then it's going to happen to you, and it's going to happen to our land. So I encourage you to, um, to do some more research on that. And um, you can go online and, and read more about um, Donald uh, Goldsberg's GoFundMe page and, um, and see if you'd like to help. Thank you. Uh, and so the last thing I wanted to say real quick is um, this, this picture is from a holding ground event we had this summer. Uh, we, the, sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, this was important to me because uh, the day before this event, my grandfather died. And um, I love Philadelphia. This is my home. Uh, but I don't, I've never been a religious person, so I don't have a, 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 a church or an organization to go to. My family's not around here. The tribe's not around here. So to be able to go to this event the day after that and hear chief man of the Ramapo Lenape on the left there uh, and everyone on the panel speak about what I know the truth of this world to be, it meant a hell of a lot to me. Um, so I'll pass it off to uh, the next group to tell you more about this uh, magical space known as Iglesias Garden. Hello, everybody. Um, first of all, thank you for everybody uh, for coming out. Um, wonderful people out here, wonderful panelists that we're with. Uh, my name is Anthony Patrick. I am from the Iglesias Garden. Um, the Iglesias Garden, as you can see, we've been established since uh, 2012. Um, our, a lot of things have changed since 2012. Uh, We've been through a lot of 
stuff. Um, oh, let me say this. I curse a lot, too, so, <laughs> so y'all know. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, shit has been happening since 2012. <laughs> uh, pandemics, changing the presidents, a lot of foreign shit going on over there, Ukraine. Uh, but, you know, the evolution of the garden, um, it's come a long way uh, since 2012. Um, I recently got involved with the garden in uh, 2018, and I live up the block. Um, so, you know, I've, I've seen the garden in, in its many stages, uh, growing up through the neighborhood, when it wasn't there, now it's there, and what it looks like now uh, compared to what it did in 2012. Um, it looks really good. Uh, Anthony, before you go on, will you tell them what the garden is and that you're from the land circle? Like what kind of space it is and what your issue is, just so they know. Oh, all right. Yeah, we, we're, we're a community garden um, based in North Philadelphia, Lawrence and North Street. Uh, we uh, have been responsible for, uh, it's, I was getting there, but you, you just, <laughs> you just jump started me right there. <laughs> but I mean, I just, you know, but yeah, um, we've been responsible for a lot of the uh, things going on. We recently had a, a article published in the Enquirer um, talking, it was referencing, you know, garden refugees, green refugees, um, how, see, you tore that up, because Lauren was supposed to get in this, but. Staying in order is just these different introductions for different comedians. So they're from the land circle, that's really all you need to know. That's how you got Yeah, sorry about that, land circle. Yeah, um, yeah, we're from the land circle. Uh, you know, green, green is the way to go. Uh, damn, they really tore me up. I'm so yeah, sorry. No, yes, back. please. Sorry. Yes, All right. Right. All right. Um, hi, my name is Lauren. Um, I'm also a volunteer and organizer from the Iglesias Gardens. Um, and yeah, we are part of the, the land circle, and we also were like the hub space for this project. Um, our garden was the hub space. And. Um, yeah, so we, we had, you know, as a garden and as an organization, we had not really gotten a lot of major funding over the past 10 years that we've been a garden. And we've grown a lot in the last, you know, like four or five years, but this was kind of the first time that we received like thousands of dollars from an institution, which was something we were really nervous to do. And also like, as one of the few white women who also have worked in a nonprofit before, I was really nervous to like, you know, didn't want that to impact the work that we were doing at the grassroots level. Um, but one thing that was really important about this project was as the, as the hub space, um, Mural Arts was able to donate a shipping container that kind of the events were coming out of, and this allowed us to then get solar panels on top of the shipping container. Um, some other folks from the garden are turning it into like a learning kitchen. It's really gonna springboard a lot. We just got um, like free community Wi-Fi from another organization. Um, and this is really important because it's been a way um, for us to continue to build autonomy. You know, like when these natural disasters are gonna continue to happen because of climate change, it's gonna be the people, you know, as you all know, on the ground that are there, you know, giving the food boxes, cleaning up the street after the flood, um, you know, so I think it's really important for nonprofits to start thinking more about how can you build up autonomy at these grassroots spaces so that, you know, they can continue to do that important work. Um, yeah, and another thing uh, that was that was really important about this project was kind of the collaborative budgeting. You know, we, we looked at like the total sum together with all the different groups. And another thing that is hard, uh, you know, for organizers to get funding from nonprofit groups, it's like sometimes you get into this like competition space where there's a lot of people doing similar work, but there's only so much money, you know, to go around to support the work. 
Um, so seeing kind of like the budget as a whole and like that transparency of the breakdown, um, you know, was really important and we could help make some decisions about how the money was spent. Yeah. yeah sorry. I'm back again. Thank you, Shari. <laughs> Yeah, uh, um, yeah. Since since I've come into the garden, you know, it's it's been uh, a bunch of things going on. I met a lot of different people that I never thought I'd meet before, um, you know. And we all just we don't all get along, but it's it's all right though. Um, you know, we do. The garden does provide a space for all of us to, you know, come together, talk about things that are pressing on our minds you know, release from the daily, the monotony of our nine to fives and, you know, the responsibilities that we have. It's, it's, it's really like a free space for, you know, things to just be. And I can attest to this myself. I'm a person that is just being, I'm in the moment consistently frazzled. Uh, but yeah, always, you know, we do things on our own terms, no one, there's no real hard timeline set for us. There's just things that we do when we want to do it, but you know, we have a lot of intentionality behind everything that we do, um, especially with all of the work that we do in the community, in service to the community, from the community, because we do have a lot of community members that are with us. Um, yeah, we, we don't, we try not to rush things uh, because when you rush something it's a wrap you fall over you know it's not it's not good for you but you know we take our time with a lot of the things that we do um, we try to build as many relationships as we can with a lot of members in the community um, the canvassing efforts that we put forth um, not just in our community but throughout the city of Philadelphia for the various campaigns that we've run um, and had collaborative help from Mural Lawrence uh, and other, other entities throughout the city. But yeah, we, we keep on trucking. Uh, and wish we had a, a couple of links to uh, our pages and whatnot, but um, Y'all could come check us out, the Q&A and everything. We'll, we'll have that set up for y'all, so I'm going to pass this over to Adriana. Hi. Hi, I'm Adriana, Adriana, and um, so I was the project manager for the hub space, and one part that was really important for me was just getting to know everybody from the garden. So I spent a lot of time there from, like, moving the shipping container and spending that entire cold day with everybody and getting to know everybody on a very personal level because, you know, it was March and it was cold. Um, and then just continuing to attend events as it led up to the project that was going to happen in the summer, um, just like attending different events that the garden was already hosting, seeing how they functioned in that space um, and getting to know how they worked. Like they said, it's a little bit slower, no timelines and we're mural arts is a nonprofit, so there are timelines, unfortunately. Um, and so when I started working with all the participants to hear like their proposals for events, and um, the land circle are the people who got to propose kind of events for this hub space, um, and that included Iglesias Garden, um, Natives in Philly. And so when we heard their proposals, there a lot of them didn't have. Um, timelines and that was fine and I kind of said that myself but with the recognition also that those timelines are often not realistic for people who are doing activism and also living their lives so it's just a lot of flexibility in what was happening so I would either text them and be like hey I need this when can it happen and then it happened eventually and so the biggest part was like having the confidence and knowing that all the organizations that we were working with for the events in June were super, um, they're super competent people. Like they've built, built these organizations up themselves. And so just knowing that they were gonna do what they needed to do for their event. Um, and that was the biggest part. Cause yeah, there are internal timelines for us, but it's just, you know, 
It is what it is. And then another part of that structure was like, as I mentioned, each group kind of proposed their own events. Um, as a strategy circle, we also propose an event back to them while they are proposing an event. So one of the events that we proposed was the holding ground panel. Um, and just because it seemed based on some conversations that other members of the strategy circle had, that there was a need to bring more land people together. Um, and so this event was kind of structured in that way. Um, and just building capacity for each group through helping them manage parts of the event, whether they needed a million chairs or tables and stuff like that. Just building capacity for the groups without making decisions for them was the most important part of June. Um, yeah, and I've gotten to know them, so they've been amazing. Um, and that's kind of my part. I don't know. <laughs> So we're, we're not going to do a Q&A because everything got pushed, and we're all here through the day so you can ask us questions, particularly on lunch, because all those things that Adriana spoke about, that um, Denise and Dakota, all those things have actual mechanisms, like there's an actual proposal form, there's an actual, like how to, so, like a thing transparent about what capacity we can offer without making decisions for people. So we developed like an infrastructure to, for us to provide capacity without um, messing with the autonomy of all the groups we're working in. So we have all that real stuff too. Um, and so please feel free to come up and ask us anything you want later on. All right, thank you so much to the CJI panel. So right now I would like to invite the Aquamarooned panel to be seated, and I'll tell you a little bit about them. If you've ever played Apples to Apples or Cards Against Humanity, you might have some sense of the card game Aquamarooned, commissioned by the Alliance for Watershed Education of the Delaware River. AWE aims to raise awareness and appreciation of the over 13,000 square mile system which provides clean drinking water for 13 million people. Aquamarooned is one of two innovative and unique artist-driven projects by the Alliance, highlighting that mission across their cohort of 23 centers in the tri-state region between Pennsylvania, Delaware, and New Jersey. While advancing the goals of envi environmental programming that speak to equity, indigenous sovereignty, and community engagement, the work is also interactive, fun and can be played anywhere outdoors to help people connect with nature. Players call on their powers of observation, inventiveness, or wit to help um, as they become extraterrestrial explorers sent to discover Earth's mysterious water sphere. Please welcome the creators, organizers, and contributors to this wonderful game, which is included in your tote bags. So I think we're going to begin with introductions, and Adrian, as the founder, would you mind speaking? Uh, ah, <laughs> hopefully you can hear me. Um, my name is Adrian Mackey. I am the founder of Swim Pony, uh, which is a live performance and game design company. I also teach theater at the University of Washington, um, and I was one of the two artists selected for the Lenape Hoking Watershed Project. Uh, and was the lead game designer on Aquamarooned. Thank you. Tina? Hi, my name is Tina Plukertz. I'm the director for environmental art at the Schuylkill Center for Environmental Education. Um, and we are um, one of the 23 centers um, of the Alliance for Watershed Education who have invited um, Adrian Mackey to produce this kite game. 
um, basically commissioned this Kaipim as our first art initiative um, as a big cohort um, for this function. Priscilla, is it working? Thank you. Mabrika usa lokale na nakuno. Priscilla Berlinieri. Hi, good morning. Welcome. My name is Priscilla Bell Lamberti, and um, I was the community liaison for the Lenapehokan Watershed uh, Art Project for the Alliance of Watershed Education. Can you hear me? <laughs> um, I'm Chloe Wong. I work in river programs at Bartram's Garden, which is also a um, member center of the Alliance for Watershed Education. Um, I'm also co-chair of the steering committee of the Alliance for Watershed Education, and um, I serve on the network development work group, which plans um, professional development opportunities um, for the centers. So I have been less directly involved in the development of Aquamarooned, but um, I have been active in um, kind of indigenous engagement efforts of the Alliance. So um, I'll speak to that a little bit uh, as it relates to and extends from Aquamarooned. So let's begin by um, talking a little bit about how the project evolved and the initial goals. Um, Adrian and Tina, if you'd like to speak to that. Do you want to talk about the alliance and then I can talk about how I responded creatively? Yeah, I think that's great. Um, I first wanted to say um, quickly, you, what you were seeing here um, on the screens is a couple of uh, images from the card game, but also from uh, interactions and activities that we have hosted over the last year, roughly over the uh, last year, uh, with Aquamarine. So this will give you our, our first introduction to the card game and what we will also do on Saturday at uh, the Skoko Center if you would like to come out and play with us. Um, but yes, so, so initially, um, as I said, the Alliance for Watershed Education um, had this idea for inviting artists for an first art initiative. So thinking about the fact like how art can help us in, in a way to enter new communities and enter new ways of thinking and bringing uh, to our spaces. Um, people who have maybe not involved at all with environmental practices. Um, so rather than thinking we have to hammer our environmental education into communities, we wanted to um, ease and like think about other ways of entrance points. Um, so we started that process in 2017 um, as a research uh, project um, where we like then launched an RFQ to artists like to propose what they would do to create a signifier throughout our whole watershed. We are an alliance that brings together Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Delaware, um, all of these different communities uh, throughout the whole Delaware watershed. Um, and it was also initiated an art um, working group in the alliance that I'm leading for the last two years um, that helped um, making this process smooth. And our really initial goal for this was to create a larger um, community that is involved with us, especially also communities that are surrounding each of the centers. So it's about also the individual center, but also about the whole watershed. How are we connected as a larger community? Um, so we wanted to demonstrate with these projects um, a sense of connectivity among people um, attract visibility to each of the centers, what they're, they're doing, what are their goals, um, and ultimately um, really attract new audiences to these places in a very diverse way. Yeah, and then we selected for a selection and research project, um, um, yeah, program, we selected Adrian Mackey for Aquamarooned, and we selected also Sarah Cabbage for Water Spirits. Um, 
installations throughout uh, all of these centers. Uh, let's talk Adrian a little bit more. Yeah. Um, so when I got the sort of, when I saw the RFP about the project, I was interested in thinking, okay, well, if I'm creating, if the, if the aim is to create a game that invites people into spaces that they're not going to, um, there are a couple of things that we wanted to think about. One is like, how do you invite somebody who feels like an outsider into a space in a way that feels comfortable and exciting? And so part of it was thinking, okay, well, we definitely um, want to subvert, I really liked that um, artistic disruptor idea, um, that if these spaces feel, um, I call them sometimes like NPR beige, uh, <laughs> if they don't feel like inclusive spaces, um, you don't necessarily want to use the tactics that are already in place with them to continue to reify the same story that's being told. So how do you tell a different kind of story? So um, we created a game where the state of winning it didn't have to depend on you having any information about being there before. And we really wanted to create a sense of curiosity and excitement and discovery without a lot of need for didactic information coming in. So you might be a trained botanist, and I wanted to create a game that didn't prize that person any more than somebody who was seeing the space for the very first time. Um, so we built this story in the game where you are an excited adventurer coming to this place for the first time and using your skills of observation rather than pre-existing knowledge to try to learn about it, discover it, sense it. And we really wanted to prize not only uh, ways of knowing and being in the world that are um, word and thought based, but also experiential and sensory and tactile. Um, so we proposed a game that had like four kinds of prompts in it. Um, and they mentioned in the introduction, apples to apples is a game if you've ever played that before. Um, you hold the deck of cards and the person gets to read out the challenge and then all the other players get to execute it. Uh, so. For example, like a card might be um, find a dead thing and give it a heartfelt eulogy, which encourages you to run around, find a thing, and then use your particular skills and experience to interpret that prompt. And then the person who's actually holding the card gets to decide who the winner is. So there isn't an objective right answer. There's the right answer for these people in this moment, in this place, and the way they experience it. So that the game becomes an opportunity to create conversation and bridges between the people and the center, um, rather than being a place where they're only in passive receiving mode of what the center has to offer. Um, so that was kind of like the core conception of the game. As Tina mentioned, the game had to speak to the idea of the watershed as a whole, but also wanted an opportunity to highlight individual centers. So we um, collaboratively came up with this idea of a core deck of cards that was playable literally anywhere you could go outside. Um, so that, and that was really important, especially to some of the urban centers who said like some of our constituents don't always have access to like massive green spaces. And we wanted to make sure the game was playable no matter where they wanted to play it. Um, and then we created an individual expansion pack with each individual center that highlighted some content or questions or metaphors or themes that was unique to them. Um, so that was kind of like the core conception of the game and how we sort of embedded that mission into the design. Um, and I wanted to mention here also the third component is um, that we then later on in the conversation about with our community liaisons thinking about Lenape Hoking and the whole watershed, um, thinking about the land itself and who owned it, we came with uh, Priscilla to the idea that we really need to reach out to the Leni Lenape Nation and think with them through what this card game could do for their community. Um, so in the later component, we added um, basically another extension pack where Leni Lenape people had the chance to um, really integrate their thinking and their knowledge uh, about the land. And that was what Priscilla um, really initiated as our community organizer. Yes, thank you, Tina. Um, yeah, I was brought on uh, pretty, pretty early on, around 2018, I think, a little late about 2018, as a community liaison. And my job was to 
a bridge that connection between the community themselves, the, the center, uh, the various centers throughout the, the watershed, and also with the artists. So um, very early on, um, everything was in planning stage. Of course, um, we had these concepts, and uh, we didn't even have a name for the art project yet. <laughs> and oh boy, was that a, a very interesting journey. Uh, to say the least, because um, you know what what name for the art project would kind of like encompass this whole like big grand idea of bringing um, bringing art to the communities, but also engaging them uh, with the environment and uh, the centers that they live close by. And um, I was kind of like I was just thinking about it, just looking at the map, and I was just like, you know, there's something for. It. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's like basically the entirety of the watershed is within the, t the traditional uh, territory of the Lenin Lenape people. And I was like, wow, we need to bring um, you know, some local tribes into uh, this conversation. And I think that uh, also Chloe can talk about this as well. Um, yeah, I, does this microphone work? <laughs> we'll just share. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think early on we kind of, there was some contentious conversation about, you know, um, this idea of naming the art project um, Lenape Hoking Watershed um, because we hadn't started by recruiting any indigenous artists to, um, create the art. <laughs> um, so what does it mean to call this project by an indigenous name? Um, it kind of, uh, I think, necessitated that um, the project engage with and bring honor to and um, benefit to um, the Lenape in the area. So um, yeah, ultimately the name was adopted and um, that was kind of part of the impetus behind um, like this card game, uh, bringing in the Lenape deck component. Um, so I think, um, yeah, it was like a kind of leap of faith to um, take on the challenge of, um, you know, living up to this decision to acknowledge um, native land in that way. Yeah, and uh, I really wanted, uh, I know we were having these conversations and I, you know, we were thinking about it being very important to um, include the Native folks uh, in this conversation, specifically the Lenape um, from the area, uh, especially when we, uh, when we have these communities, these centers that are within these communities and the most that they uh, educate folks or kind of like mention about the Lenin Lenape is just maybe a, an artifact that's behind a glass, um, a glass case or they would uh, mention like a little placard or something like that. And uh, how, how can we not only uh, bring actual real knowledge uh, about Native folks um, to the, the communities that are surrounding the areas, but also engage um, and have conversations with uh, local Lenape tribes and continue the conversations even beyond the art project um, you know, duration, right? So continue these conversations. And that's how it was, uh, it was pretty much very important for us to um, to bring uh, bring aboard uh, native voices, Lenape voices, within uh, this conversation um, through the Water Spirits uh, Sarah Cavish's uh, art project, and also Aqua Marooned. 
Um, and I would like to add here, like maybe Alien can speak to how she was actually working with each of the centers, but also with the Lenny Lenape nation. Um, because like when she was talking to the centers, it was uh, really about um, what I said earlier about now highlighting each of these centers, um, what their history is, what they want to highlight, how want they, um, what how do they want to represent themselves, but also what is their aspiration, um, what community they want to invite to the spaces, um, and what they want to work on. And I think that was something I really, um, when we did the process about um, uh, the Skoko Center's deck, um, it was really about like thinking, um, these are the things that we are doing well, but what are the things that we would like to do better, or that we want to teach about, that we are thinking are important um, to let people know about the watershed, but not, as Adrian explained, not, not in the way of like, I'm telling you from the top down uh, what you have to know, rather than letting people experience, explore, and discover themselves in each of these centers. Um, and that I think that's like kind of playfulness um, made it really important to the centers to be engaged with the artists very closely. Um, the way that we developed all the cards was really through conversation. Obviously, I did a lot of research and went to all the sites and tried to learn as much as I could, but at the core of it, my feeling as an artist wasn't to come in and become an expert, but to think about how do I create a forum for the experts to share their knowledge in a different way, um, or to share the spaces that they curate and caretake for in a different way. And so, generally, with each of the um, expansion packs at the center, um, my co-writer and I, along with the two illustrators, Meg Lemur and Bree Barton, would go there and just see how we felt at the site, just kind of take it in, you know, as a relative newcomer ourselves. We would schedule a meeting with the center and just ask them a million questions and just go, tell us everything you think about this space and, and just try to data gather. And then my co-writer and I would go away, take all that information and oftentimes lots of other auxiliary materials and just try to think about how to translate the things that they talked about and that they said they wanted people to think, feel, or imagine in their space and try to create a prompt that encouraged people to create that knowledge for themselves. So rather than saying like, um, you know, you're in a freshwater tidal marsh uh, here's a bunch of information about it, to go like, okay, you're standing in this place, where do you think water comes from? And rather than giving that information, which is probably somewhere in an amazing exhibit that already exists at the site, to ask a question that gets people observing or thinking or feeling or touching or sensing in a way that would make them go, oh, I wanna know more about this. I wonder if there's something here that helps me do that. Um, so we would take those prompts away, come back with a list, and then show it to the center. And then in almost every case, um, there were lots of things that we didn't understand or didn't know, and that the center would then give us feedback on. And there was a, a process of dialogue going back and forth to make sure that the questions and the way we framed them really spoke to what the center wanted to share with the communities. Um, and then usually we would go and play test the cards with folks who didn't know anything about the center to sort of see how they responded to it. Um, the Lenape deck um, went through a similar kind of process uh, with the additional fact that um, through Priscilla's introduction to Trinity Norwood, who was our liaison to the Nanticoke Lene Lenape folks, um, we'd been in a long conversation with Trinity. And actually like in the midst of the Aquamarine development, I worked with Trinity on a different project. <laughs> um, so we luckily had had a long conversation. She helped us create a tribal advisory circle where we did a similar process where we just hung out. I explained the game to them. Um, that was actually the best of the sessions. <laughs> they were like that group of folks like got the game immediately and um, we almost like didn't have to do any rewriting of the cards because the prompts that they gave us were so rich. We were originally just gonna do 12 and there were so many amazing, fun prompts that they offered us that we ended up expanding it to a 20 card pack. So it was like 
a supersize, we had to like change the budget because we were like, we need to make a supersized Lenape deck. Um, uh, and in all cases, um, both with the Lenape deck and with the center decks, um, we asked for a lot of input in terms of like the visual iconography, um, so that in addition to just the, the language that the images were also inspired by folks. Was there anything that really surprised you about either community engagement or the collaborative process? Any stories to share, anecdotes? Um, maybe that's also something that uh, I could share a little bit um, of one of the centers, and maybe Chloe can also speak to that. Um, as this um, conversation continues, um, one of the really ama major things I think is about this card game that it really touches people personally and emotionally. And what Adrian said, like um, bringing to them an experience. Um, and I do feel that art has the capacity of like um, bringing up something that is, is new, exciting, and can teach us something in new and uh, various new ways. And I think the Alliance has really embrace this now as an opportunity for them to explore um, not only environmental education, but also education through art. Um, and we would love to continue that process. Um, so it really has uh, broken also our, our normal patterns of didactics and how we want to teach. Um, and one of the things then um, we have mainly incorporated this card game almost like an environmental tool for teaching. Um, and we are right now um, in the process of uh, also expanding that um, um, with a facilitator who is like reaching out to really schools and um, engaging with teachers together to write almost like a lesson plan, how you can use this in history class or science class or literature class even. Um, and to teach kids uh, about the immediate environment they are living in. Um, and on a personal note, I have used this card a lot of times, uh, card game a lot of times as an icebreaker. When you talk about um, environmental practices, um, also environmental art shows, um, a lot of times it feels like um, beyond what they are normally doing and it's um, they, um, they feel less invited to it, but when you then give them a card game um, and they are playing together, creating a community in these like groups together, and then bring them back and let them talk about what they have just experienced and what they have learned or what they have seen. If they have seen like the trees in our forest, they have seen the birds around them, they have like noticed different things that they might not have noticed beforehand. And I think these little disruptions, I really I like that uh, title as well. Um, disruptions are really important to each of our centers um, to really make people um, create an invitation, but also um, create a connection that they might not have before. Um, and one of, another anecdote, we um, did uh, a gameplay where we had folks coming in, but they were um, in smaller groups. And this card game makes a lot of fun when you are a larger group. So we just hooked them up together. Um, so match make, basically. Um, and that kind of new introduction to new folks, <clears throat> a lot of people really liked um, and had really interesting new conversations with people they would never have talked to in their life. And about like the card game was um, and the site was almost like the entry point to getting to know new people around them. Um, and as I said, we are um, in the process of like um, thinking how we can like reach better the communities that we are working with. Um, and Chloe, as she said, is working on uh, working with the Lenape um, Nation to develop actually land acknowledgement for each of our centers. So maybe you could talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, so um, I am currently uh, kind of managing a project um, that we're calling 
an indigenous consultation and engagement project for the Alliance. Um, and so we have three um, advisors, each representing one of um, our local Lenape tribal nations um, on that project. So that's um, Chief Coker of the Lenape Indian Tribe of Delaware, Chief Mann of the Ramapo Lenape Turtle Clan, and um, Trinity Norwood, tribal citizen of the Nanticoke Lenni Lenape Nation in New Jersey, who, um, as Adrian mentioned, had already been very involved in um, the, this art project. Um, so uh, there are three major components to this project. One is um, that these advisors are helping us to develop an alliance-wide native land acknowledgement template that can be customized to each of the 23 centers in the watershed. Um, and the idea behind this was to kind of um, minimize redundancy of requests for this kind of consultation um, while maximizing representation in terms of who is contributing. So um, the and this is not um, by any means our, our first engagement with, um, with the three advisors. We've gotten to know them over the last two years um, through other engagements. We invited um, some of them to speak at a conference in early 2020. We've participated in um, like volunteer efforts. Um, so. Yeah, I, on the last panel, people were talking about how important it is to um, like get to know folks before um, like diving into a big project together. Um, so people in the Alliance had sort of um, become aware of our local indigenous leaders and everyone wants to develop a land acknowledgement these days. So. Um, naturally, it led to many requests from many different centers um, going to the same people um, who, you know, are chiefs um, or leaders in their um, tribal nations, so they don't necessarily have a lot of time and capacity to field every single um, request for help with a native land acknowledgement. So we wanted to sort of consolidate that um, in a way that also incorporates input from um, all three of these proximal tribal nations um, and not just one individual. Um, so the second component of that project is um, a protocol and etiquette training uh, that will be delivered to um, Alliance centers and that training seeks to kind of um, establish some and educate around some like best practices for uh, interaction with indigenous communities um, to kind of uh, ensure that we are bringing honor in our interactions and not harm. Um, and then the third component is what we're calling a reciprocity fund. So those, um, the land acknowledgement template and the, the training are, um, you know, it's an exchange where we are compensating our consultants for um, their contributions, but ultimately the asks are coming from the Alliance. Um, and so the reciprocity fund is just for emergent ideas that um, are coming from uh, the tribal nations themselves to um, give them a chance to, to make some asks that we can support as well. Um, so yeah, I think the, the consulting arrangement that um, the art work group kind of established through the development of Aqua Marooned um, set a really helpful precedent for this project and um, there was sort of a, a seamless um, lead in from one to the other where um, Trinity did um, was involved in the development of the proposal for, um, for this uh, consultation project as well. Um, so yeah, this is really a first phase. These are like very basic um, early steps in relationship building, but um, I think getting to know each other better is like part of the point so that 
through the development of this land acknowledgement and training, we're also just um, continuing to, to build and repair relationship. Thank you. We have uh, some time for one or two questions from the audience, and there's a microphone here that we can pass around. Thanks, Sergio. Hi. You can you hear me? Okay. You spoke about the education part of it, and you spoke about um, teachers being able to use this. I know Texas has. Texas has recently gone through some changes in their curriculum. Have you all tried to reach out to, I don't know how they do it here in Philly, the state level and, and curriculum development writers so that this could be a part of um, the science curriculum for the entire school system? And then that way, this will be something that would be continuously taught in the classroom. Um, very good question. Um, honestly, not yet. Um, uh, as I said, we are in the like um, developing phase with that um, because we notice that we are handing these cards out, or people can pick them up. And how one of our um, facilitators also called it like it's a message in a bottle. You are sending it out, and you don't know if people are really playing it, how they are interacting with it, what they are actually gaining from it. We can guess as we are like doing some of the outreach and some of the activities around it, but we don't really know. So, um, to your question, like trying to establish a couple of like piloting uh, lesson plans or one lesson plan that we then can like reach out state level or um, city level and see how it could be really integrated. Um, but we want to first do this research. How does it work? Like, what would a teacher do, and how we can like really integrate this to um, a science class? Because we have one um, one science teacher who has started this process by herself, um, and we want to now make this really a um, uh, a precedent for uh, future collaboration and future school involvement. Yeah, but thank you for asking that. Um, and uh, like, I think we are trying to work on it. Um, but the other component is maybe also we need to say um, some of these cards are and some of the centers are almost gone. So we are doing now outreach for a year. We had in our budget, um, this was almost with two, these two artists and almost uh, one million, pro uh, million um, dollar project. Um, the Napa Hoking watershed, and we are now trying to think like, is there a way that we could like reprint these card games? Where would we bring them, and how we want to engage with them in, into the future? Thank you. Are there any other questions? Yes. Good. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Erica. I work at a local nonprofit or regional nonprofit partnership for the Delaware Estuary. Um, I know you mentioned just now that you're looking at being able to print more and distribute more. Um, so yeah, that was going to be my question, but now I guess it's more of a comment um, that we would love to see this distributed, I guess, in the region. I think there's a lot of places um, where people don't visit environmental centers, um, specifically in a lot of environmental justice communities. Maybe they just don't know it exists or don't have the capacity to get there to get the game. Um, so I think looking for ways to partner with other local organizations on the ground um, so that they can be the ones to bring this to the communities would be really valuable. Um, I just looked through the cards and they look awesome. <laughs> one thing that Swim Pony um, 
like our kind of tenure officially with Awe, it like sort of completed with the printing of the game, although it's been great to like stay involved and in conversation and like see the awesome pictures of the event. Um, but we've been sort of exploring um, a prototype of can you turn the card game into a mobile app? Because though there's something awesome about a tactile object, obviously, um, it's a lot easier to distribute. You know, we, we printed 15,000 copies, um, but 15,000 copies over three states and 23 sites like get small really quickly. Um, and so like we just started developing a prototype for an app version um, that theoretically could like be nationwide and like sense where you are automatically and like fold in local flora and fauna and that kind of stuff. Um, so this project definitely like environmental art is like my jam, so um, it's something that um, I know Swim Pony will continue to work with. We'll definitely always like be super friends of awe and like um, if you're interested in like knowing about that, you can certainly like find me after or like sign up for our um, mailing list. And um, that project is something that I think will continue to develop creatively. So this is definitely to me feels like just the beginning of it. And we did have another question here. Thanks. Um, I guess my question is just sort of now that you've spent several years doing like a watershed scale project, um, what you've learned about how people imagine the watershed, like as a as an entity, because it's something that's kind of abstract. But I mean, to sort of Jane's point earlier, right? Like a lot of this work is about, you know, sort of like the imagination and shifting narrative. And so to what extent have you, have you sort of, what have you gleaned about sort of like how we can better wrap our heads around this thing that could be abstract, um, like a watershed and how to make art on that scale too? I can say, if you had asked me before I made this game, like if you'd pointed at me on the street and said like, gun to your head, what's a watershed? I don't know if I would have given an awesome answer. Um, and so I think in a way, the game, um, the attempt of the game is to say, like it's a complex, it is, it's a complex idea. Um, and but, you know, through the questions that you ask and the visuals, like there's literally a map of the watershed inside the game, um, so that you start to, even if you don't have a verbal definition yet, you're like, something about this has to do with like this huge scope of land, and that has to do with the people that are indigenous to this place for a really long time, and it has to do with where things are moving and going from, so that um, like the huge scope of this project from like, the center environmental side to the outreach side that Priscilla worked on, like all of that is encapsulated in the thing. Um, and at least in our play tests, you know, would somebody answer an SAT question about what is the watershed, like with word perfect answers? Maybe, maybe not. Um, but do I think that they walk away with a better sense of like, thinking curiously about how the land and water are connected to each other and to themselves. I, that's, that's, I think, what I saw as the success of, of the game when we watch people playing it. Um, I totally agree with Adrian. Um, and I think it's also about um, not only the larger level of the whole watershed, it is about the small level of each of these centers like what their specific landscape is, their ecology, but how it is connected to the larger environment of the watershed. Um, so our little river or creek, how it is connected as a tributary to the larger Delaware River, and how it is then like flows into a new landscape close to our center or our neighboring community, and how that is then connected to our um, and I think these cards um, don't tell you, don't give you that answer, but they ask these questions in the way, like what kind of habitats are you seeing here? The different versions of habitats, the different ideas about them. And as you like look around, you will discover that rather than us telling you, um, these, 
this meadow, this forest, this river, this um, this creek is all part of this watershed, and these birds and these trees with that, and how you can be part of that conversation. Um, and I think that's the beauty about it, rather um, rather than giving you the answer, um, making you discover the answer. So yes, it's a complicated story of like telling. I have learned something about a watershed, but I have maybe learned something this particular environment and how I connect to it. Um, and one other part, like as we have developed these um, 19 extension packs, you can actually collect them. So um, the core part, or what I really like about it is that you can like, your core deck is the starting point for then adding all of the layers of extension packs. So you build up your watershed as you develop like a very big deck, basically. Um, and if you have that, in the end, you have visited the watershed. You have experienced the watershed. So you will get to learn also what this watershed is. I just want to piggyback on that really fast um, to kind of really kind of figure out the scope of uh, the watershed. Uh, we, we were working with centers in uh, all the way up to, from Trenton, New Jersey, uh, to the Poconos, uh, all the way down to Wilmington, Delaware, and a lot of uh, city city centers as well. So that kind of and Camden, um, New Jersey. So there was a lot of these centers that we were working with. And what I also like about uh, the card game is that you don't necessarily, I mean, it's really great if you go to the centers and that's why uh, the card game was developed. But also you can kind of like take these card games and you can take this card game and you can uh, go to your local park, you know, or, you know, uh, local green space and you can play this game as well. So it's very versatile. Just one thing about that, um, in the design of the expansion packs, they, de they definitely target content and um, information related to the centers, but they're designed in such a way that if you've played them once at the center, you can take them away and play them again elsewhere. And so part of the replay of the game is noticing how the same question shows up differently. So you might, like there's a card that says like, first person to pick up five pieces of trash wins. Um, and that's gonna be really different if you're in an urban environment versus like out in the middle of the Poconos. And that the awareness of how the game changes, like, oh, interesting, like I have to find bird calls and I can't find them right now, um, is also kind of like an ongoing change in the, and, and awareness in the changes of the landscape. Thank you so much. Any final thoughts as we close this panel? If you haven't played it, come out on Saturday and play it with us. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you so much. As Tina mentioned, on Saturday, uh, there's an opportunity to play this game from 10.30 to 11.30 a.m. at the Schuylkill Center for Envir Environmental Education. And you can um, click on the QR code to find out more information about that. Right now, we're going to take a break for lunch, and we'll be breaking until 1.30 p.m. We have vegan, vegetarian, chicken, and tuna options available on the roof deck. And we really want to encourage you during this time uh, to introduce yourself to other people who may be visiting from other cities outside of Philadelphia and to get to know one another. Feel free to spread out. You can be here in the conference room or, or in the conference room or on the roof deck. And we'll see you again at 1.30. Thanks.